Order members, the sitting is now resumed and it's now time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Can I advise members that question number seven has been withdrawn and I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one please. The dairy sector makes a very important contribution to the local agri-food industry and to ensure its future sustainability it's vital that the sector remains competitive and profitable. When milk quotas end, there will be no constraints on production and future decisions will be taken by the dairy sector in the context of input costs and market returns. Some turbulence in the market may be expected as other countries ramp up, um, ramp up production and this in turn could affect milk prices here. However, I am encouraged by the first report of the Economic Board of the new EU Milk Market Observatory and the EU optimism about um, market prospects and milk pr um, prices going forward. My department's overall aim is therefore to help the dairy sector to improve its performance and grow its potential in the marketplace in a sustainable way. For example, we provided joint support with InvestNI for an industry-led dairy competitiveness study aimed at helping the sector to plan for the future post-milk quotas. The recommendations of that study are now being taken forward by the dairy industry. The dairy sector has the potential to grow further and to exploit the opportunities arising from the um, predicted expansion in world population. My department will continue to support the dairy sector's growth ambitions as set out in the Agri-Food Strategy Board's report, Going for Growth, through the provision of education, training, technical support and research to help improve efficiency, competitiveness and innovation. In addition, it's envisaged that the sector will be able to avail of support under the new uh, Rural Development Programme. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank the Minister for answers. Can the Minister uh, enlighten us? Following the much discussion there has been in the press, about illegal movement of milk, milk actually flowing from farmers in the Republic of Ireland into Northern Ireland. What discussion she has, has, has taken place between her and the Agriculture Minister in the Republic to stop this illegal trading of milk? Well, obviously, I condemn any illegal trading of milk or any illegal activity. Um, this is something that we have discussed. Not in any specifics, but we have discussed that in SMC meetings. And I'm assuming the members referring to the weekend's articles actually in the Sunday Times, um, where it indicated that CAB and the South are investigating um, potential paramilitary links and, um, to that activity. So I'm aware of that report, and it's um, vital that all agencies work together, that we're able to cooperate with each other, um, no matter what your role is. And I um, can assure the member that my department, through its enforcement team and through my staff, will, will play their role in making sure that. Um, we protect the reputation of our milk industry, which is obviously key in moving forward, but also that we expose and bring to court any of those that are involved in any illegal activity. I call Rosie McCorley. My other last one, Corley, or because Gumbia Seleccionara as a fragri. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Can I ask the Minister, can she elaborate, please, on the um, support that our department has given to the dairy sector? Gormayoga. Yes, um, absolutely. My department has provided support through many ways, particularly through a number of years ago through the industry-led dairy competitive study, which is um, helping the dairy industry prepare for the end of milk quotas in 2015. And then Dairy UK is leading on the implementation of the recommendations of that study. Also through the work of the Agri-Food Strategy Board, which was established, um, it has set very challenging growth targets for the local agri-food industry up into 2020 and currently the local dairy um, industry receives and will continue to receive significant assistance from government through the work we do around research, training, knowledge transfer, benchmarking and product innovation alongside financial assistance through both the regional food programme and also the rural development programme. My aim is to ensure that the dairy sector can meet the challenges ahead and continue to make a very important contribution to the local economy and to life in rural areas. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I follow on from, from Mr. Dunn's supplementary question, Minister? In terms of your discussions you've had with Minister Coveney, could you explain to the House regarding any discussions regarding the dairy milk industry in Ireland and the abolition of the milk quotas? I apologise, I didn't quite hear the question, but it, if you want me to elaborate in terms of the conversations with. Yes, it's, re it's regarding the Irish government position and clearly the milk quotas in, in the South as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are obviously um, natural challenges that there will be post quotas. Um, we are an advantage in that in the past and that we have never reached full quota. We have always worked at about 10 per cent below quota. So in a sense, quotas have not re um, restricted any production here, so in a sense that, that is a plus. However, in looking to um, the future, there are obvious challenges right across Europe, but indeed um, with the growing world population, there are obviously opportunities which we need to exploit in moving forward. So 
We need to look as quotas as a negative. Whilst there are certainly challenges, I think the challenge for us is to make sure that we exploit other markets that may be open to our local industry, and also that we work right across the island because we can um, market what we have to offer right across uh, the new markets that we'll obviously be trying to get into. So there are obvious advantages in that, and that's been some of the conversation that I've had with Simon Coveney in the past. I call Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you've said. Uh, throughout today that the department's going to help and give us a lot of generalities but no specifics. Could you be more specific as how we're going to increase our market share, how we're going to help the um, milk farmers and so on, please? Well, I mean, it goes without saying that um, the work that we've done around the agri-food strategy group around looking to what are the challenges and opportunities for the dairy sector and I want to be able to play my role. I think some of the key roles for the executive to play are particularly around exploring new markets. So that's you know, going into other um, countries which we haven't maybe been before, looking at post quota, what, what markets are open to us to be competitive. And, and so I think that there are many opportunities, and I want to play my role in terms of DARD supports for the dairy industry. So whether that be through the regional food programme, through the rural development programme, around the practical supports around innovation, research and development. So there are many levels of support that, that uh, can come both from my department but indeed from other departments to help this industry to be sustainable in the future. The industry have been very aware of the end of quotas from, um, for quite some time, so they have been preparing. And the piece of work that, they did, that um, the industry did alongside my department and DETI through Invest NI has been key in actually helping them to plan for the future. So there's many, as I said, many levels of, of support that we have been involved with, and I'm very happy to um, provide any more detail the member wants in writing. Moving on, I call Jim Allister. Question two. The process of reforming single farm payments has been ongoing for some time, both at European and local levels. My officials and I have sought to keep stakeholders in the North fully engaged in this process. In October 2013, I launched an extensive public consultation on the reform of Pillar 1 direct payments. This provided considerable analysis and outlined a suggested package of support to help focus the debate and crystallise views. I have met personally with a broad range of organisations representing all sections of the farming community. My officials have attended a large number of stakeholder meetings, which were attended by well over 3,000 people. It has been hugely valuable to me to hear from all sides in the debate as I work towards delivering a fair and balanced outcome. Everyone has had the opportunity to express their views and preferences in a very open and transparent manner. The formal consultation drew a huge reaction with over 850 responses received, and I have already announced a substantial number of capital reform decisions on which there was a significant level of agreement and which have been broadly welcomed. However, a number of key decisions remain to be taken. The allocation of almost two billion of taxpayers' money over the remainder of this decade has to be done carefully, wisely and fairly. Given the importance of the remaining decisions, I will take them to the executive. And political discussions are ongoing, and it's my intention to bring my proposals on these issues to the executive in coming weeks. I am, of course, mindful of the 1st of August 2014 deadline to notify the EU Commission of our implementation plans, and it's my intention that we will be uh, in a position to have an agreed cap pillar one structure before that date. I call Jim Allister. The Minister cannot be ignorant of the dire consequences for the farming community if we move immediately to a one region flat rate distribution. Her own departmental figures demonstrate that beyond doubt. Apart from the platitudes about seeking an agreement, what actual steps has she taken? to seek consensus on this matter. When, for example, did she last meet with the key stakeholder on the producer side, the Ulster Farmers Union? And when she talks about a paper to the executive, has she yet tabled that paper to the executive? Uh, and is she just running Minister, down the clock to get her objective order, of a single order, a a region? Members have an opportunity to place a question to the minister. minister. Okay. Um, well, in relation to the decisions, we have taken quite a number of decisions to date. To date. However, there are some key decisions still to be taken, and I'm actively pursuing us getting to a stage where we have an executive paper that we can agree on. I don't think it's ideal that we go to a position where it's flat rate immediately, for, very much so as part of the whole consultation exercise, and I have listened very carefully to the views of everybody concerned, and I'm only interested in a fair outcome and a balanced approach to cap reform. We are talking about serious amounts of money, serious amounts of taxpayers' money, and they should be distributed fairly. So in terms of taking a decision, there's a political process ongoing. I'm involved in that process, and I hope to be in a position in the next number of weeks to be able to bring an executive paper to the executive for agreement. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. 
can the Minister state at this stage if she has been involved in discussions with party leaders and with some executive colleagues in trying to reach a consensus paper that could be presented to the executive and end the uncertainty given that Scotland also has now reached agreement? I have not been involved in discussions with party leaders. There is a political process ongoing, and I am going to keep repeating that. There is no, nothing more else to add to it. In fact, the, the, the reality is there is a political process ongoing. I hope to be able to bring the paper to the executive for full discussion and hopefully agreement in the next number of weeks. I call Paul Frew. I thank uh, Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for her uh, answer so far. I would be a bit more focused than my colleague from North Antrim. Uh, Given the fact that a flat rate immediate would be a shock trauma to the industry, what can the Minister do now today to reassure the farming community that that will not be the case? I think my track record speaks for itself. Over this, um, all the consultation processes, I have listened very carefully to all the stakeholders. There is nobody that said that they didn't have the ear of the Minister because I made sure that my officials engaged at town hall meetings, um, community centres, no matter where they were asked to go, they went. So we very cl clearly listened to the views. Unprecedented numbers of people have, resp have responded to the consultation, and we have taken our time and made sure we analysed that properly. I um, absolutely see this, this sector as one of the most uh, fantastic sectors. We look at all the economic recession that we've been going through, the economic climate that we're within. This is the industry that's continued to shine. So nobody's sitting at this side of the bench is trying to disadvantage anybody in this, in, in this industry. So when looking to the future, what we need is a fair and balanced cap. We're talking about serious amounts of money, and I think it's only right and proper that should be distributed fairly, and that we have a sustainable industry into the future. So I can assure anybody from the farming community that all my decisions will, will be fair and balanced. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Frankly, I think this is a disgrace. We're three weeks left in the Assembly term before um, the summer. Still no deal on the 1st of August deadline looming. The Minister said she will bring it to the Executive. I hope she does. But Can if we she, have a question? Please? If she doesn't, would she accept that, that the clouds are gathering? She will have lost the confidence of the sector. And if she doesn't bring it to the Executive before, Can we have a question, before, please? Will she do the honourable thing and stand down? Oh, no. um, I can say it no differently. I am in a political process. I am aiming to have a decision and to bring something forward to the Executive in the next number of weeks. I can dress it up or, or change my language if the member wishes, but that is the reality of the situation. I will take my decisions in a fair and balanced manner. I won't be rushed into decisions. We're talking about £2 billion pounds of money. I am not going to be rushed into decisions just, just, just to please people. I, I accept that anybody in the farm order, community, order. Because, of, because of how um, that how this impl um, uh, affects farmers. I have listened very, very carefully, and nobody can be in any doubt of that. The track record speaks for itself. So I will take it, my decision to the executive, hopefully in the next number of weeks, and I want to be in a position, because I don't think it's in anybody's benefit that Europe takes a decision for us, because we're elected here by local people to take decisions. So that's my intention. So if, if that's not the case, it'll not be because I've been found wanting. Stephen McNew is not in his place. I call Michelle McElveen. Question four. You'll be aware that at the end of February I announced that I was planning to appoint a fisheries industry task force to undertake a fundamental examination of the challenges and the opportunities that are facing the industry and to identify options to, um, for reform to help to ensure the, the future sustainability of the local fishing sector. At the same time, I announced the provision of um, further financial assistance to the sector. Since that announcement, my department's priority was to develop and deliver the assistance scheme, whilst also seeking to establish the task force. The inaugural meeting of the Fishing Task Force will take place on Friday, the 4th of July. I call Michelle McLean. Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker, I would just like to ask the Minister just to detail what will be on the agenda and whether this will include um, options for a fishing vessel decommissioning scheme and if it's possible that fishing representatives will have the opportunity to um, pursue other agenda items through the task force? I mean, at the, at the first meeting what I want the task force to do is to consider all the options and all the issues that they may want to scope further and absolutely a decommissioning scheme will still be on the table for, for discussion and the member will be aware that we tried to progress it in the past however there wasn't agreement so um, I, I'm still keen that that's, that's an issue that I think we can explore further and there will be opportunities under the new funding round for that to actually happen so that will be on the table alongside I suppose all the current issues that are, that are um, impacting on the, on the fishing industry at this moment in time of which there are 
are many, particularly around profitability for the industry. So um, all, all at, at the inaugural meeting, what I want them to do is sit down and look at are they content with the membership? Because we want to make sure that grassroots fishermen also feel that they have been part of um, the discussions and going forward. So everything's up for um, discussion and for the industry to work with the department to decide on what they want to prioritise in, in the time ahead. I call Oliver McMullen. And I thank the Minister for their comprehensive answer. Could the Minister tell us what priority should the uh, Fishing Industry Task Force now consider? Well, as I said, priorities will include things like profitability for the sector, um, particularly for certain fleet segments and actions that are going to be required to address that. So I think that the decommission scheme will obviously be on the table. The challenges around um, wind farms and, and the conflict, obviously, that's there. There will be, I, I think, quite a range of things, but most importantly, I think, and moving forward, will also be the new EMF um, funding stream and how that actually can be uh, got out on the ground as quickly as possible and the types of schemes that um, the fishermen want to see coming forward. I call Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, this time last year you announced um, funding through the European Fisheries Fund to include the establishment of a research and development fund specifically to look at fishing gear with very low cash rates for unwanted fish. Have you any update on that, please? I can provide more detail to the member in writing, but um, suffice to say that a lot of the, um, the gear trials have been going forward. Um, if you remember, the history of this is that um, Europe wanted to impose a particular type of gear on the industry, which is something that I opposed. Uh, and brought to the Commission. We, we then have um, now trialled quite a number of gear through the research project that we took forward, and, and that is ongoing. We still, there still are some fishermen favour some, um, some type of gear over, over, over others, so um, there are obviously competing issues there. So that's still an ongoing piece of work. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. De Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that um, the time has long since passed for talking, unless and until something drastic is done for to improve the lot of the fishermen? We're going to have no fishing industry left. And would she, uh, is she closely listening to what the fishermen are telling her department? She did, in an answer to someone else earlier on, say that we are here as local representatives answering to the people. Uh, can you stand over that statement in relation to the fishing industry? Absolutely, that's, that's what we're elected here to do. Um, the reason that I'm establishing the task force is because sometimes fishermen don't always feel that their views are being represented, maybe even through groupings or also just even in their communication with the department. So my intention is that through this um, piece of work that we'll be able to, I suppose, improve communication for a start right across the board, but also look to what we can do in the department to assist fishermen, and that's all fishermen. Moving on, I call Sandra Overend. Hi, please. My department has played a key role alongside DEDIS in supporting the Agri-Food Strategy Board both during the development of Going for Growth and also as we move into the implementation phase. This involved going, um, ongoing engagement with DFP in preparing proposed government response to the report. The Deputy Minister and I have jointly submitted proposals to the Executive on the way forward for Going for Growth and I am committed to delivering on its aims and its objectives. For example, the report identifies significant opportunities for export growth in USA, Africa, the Middle and the Far East. I have already visited China to talk to officials about the quality and safety of our produce. My department is also supporting access to new markets through the efforts of supply chain development and veterinary service. Most recently, Singapore announced it was opening its markets from beef, uh, to beef from the north and northern beef sourced from southern cattle, and I am confident that others will also follow. Irrespective of the proposed market, any growth must be sustainable, and I welcome the view of the Agri-Food Strategy Board that any growth must be based on sustainability and profitability for the entire supply chain recognising the importance that each part plays in producing high-quality, traceable food. My officials are also continuing to liaise with their counterparts in other departments, including DADI and DFP, to progress agreed recommendations and have submitted bids to DFP to support preparatory work for a farm business improvement scheme. I call Sandra Overend. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It has been 13 months uh, since the strategy was first announced and uh, we've seen very little uh, for that in, in that time. The delivery, in fact, has been pretty pathetic. Uh, I, don't mind, I don't mind who the, the blame lies with, whether it's DAR, DETI or, or DFP, but in the eyes of most farmers, uh, you're letting this, the sector all down. Can the Minister give a commitment that going for growth has not been caught up in some futile game of political brickmanship? Uh, between the DUP and her party over the issue of welfare reform? 
I can give a guarantee that I'm as committed as I ever was to the Agri-Food um, Strategy Board report. Um, as I said, I have uh, sent to the Executive my response to it. And I don't think it's fair to say there's been no progress to date because there actually has. There's been quite a number of areas of work across other departments, including my own, in terms of um, progressing the, the asks of, of the document. And I'll run through just a very short list of some of the things in my department around the deferral of the export um, health charges that were identified, identified even as an obstacle to export. Um, Agri-food proactively promoted in China by myself and then also um, Japan by FMDFM. We have a, the opening of the Singapore market to beef. We've had continued work on developing the new rural development programme, which is, um, the member will be aware, I've always said is key in terms of delivering some of the key asks of the going for growth um, strategy, particularly around a foreign business improvement scheme. We've had an increase in the number of DARD um, postgraduate courses, which was an ask. We have now uh, created a dedicated um, contact point at AFPI for research and development in terms of EU funding. And we've had the reopening of the Manure Efficiency Technology Scheme. So it's incorrect to say that there hasn't been anything done to date. There is quite a lot of work that's um, ongoing, and that's just in my department. However, I want to see the finalisation of the report of the Executive sooner rather than later. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for answers thus far. Given that £250 million was originally envisaged for this scheme, can the Minister outline exa exactly what executive funds have been targeted and agreed with a suitable timetable uh, to implement a Going for Growth implementation plan? As I've said, the, the, the response to the document from both myself and the Deputy Minister is with the Executive and we're waiting for a discussion on that any day. And the key ask in that document is £250 million, for the, particularly for the Business Improvement Scheme. And this is key for the sector. This is things we can look at around land management schemes, around fencing and, uh, and um, sheds for farmers. These are key needs in the industry and something that I'm very keen to have signed off and us be able to implement those bigger projects sooner rather than later. I call Ian Mill. Could I ask the Minister uh, what impact has a 0% uh, transfer will have on the delivery of going for growth? The Member will be aware that um, the, one of the key tools for us to be able to deliver on the going for growth strategy is around the rural development programme and the new rural development programme. So it's absolutely vital that we get sufficient funds, and I've said clearly that as a result of not being able to transfer money, that the executive has to step up to the mark in terms of delivering on the additional financial support that we need to be able to do that. So, as I said, I remain committed to delivering on the aims that are set out in the strategy, and I'm exploring all options available to be able to achieve that. And I think, as I said, I believe it's more vital than ever before that the executive provides the funding and the support to help this department to be able to deliver on the objectives that are set out in the Going for Growth document, because all um, parties, and particularly in terms of myself and the Deputy Minister, signed up to this document. And it is a fantastic piece of work, and it would be a shame for it to sit on the shelf and not be taken forward because of um, a lack of investment from the executive. I call Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number six, please. <coughs> Uh, as you will be aware, um, I remain committed to relocating my departmental headquarters to the former, former military site at Ballykelly. Since I announced my intention, I and my officials have kept staff fully up to date with developments. My permanent secretary has very recently written to all staff in the department to inform them that a paper on the business case for relocation is with my, ex <coughs> excuse me, is with my executive colleagues for consideration and he is committed to providing further regular updates as required. Consultation with staff and their representatives continues through our agreed industrial relations mechanisms, known as the Whitley Arrangements. A subcommittee of departmental and staff representatives meets monthly, specifically to consult formally with NIPSA on all issues relating to relocation. More recently, a further subcommittee has been established to consider all the HR issues around relocation. And furthermore, my officials have developed a dedicated intranet site and staff have provided, been provided with an email helpline for any questions that they may have. As we move forward, my intention is that all staff and DARD will continue to be kept informed of progress and, as appropriate, are fully consulted and engaged with throughout the programme. I have previously stated my intention to continue with the commitment of the previous DARD Minister to fully engage throughout this process with staff and their representatives. To date, the engagement with NIPSA has been extensive and meaningful, and I intend to ensure that that continues. I call Michael Copeland. As always, I thank the Minister for her answer. Could you give us some idea of her estimate of the number of staff currently working in Dundonald House who, for whatever reason, may be unable or unprepared to move to the North West? And what realistic chance is there of having all these staff being offered alternative positions in the Greater Belfast area? 
The member will be aware, I don't have the exact figures with me, but the member will be aware that when we did the, the initial staff survey, we did them in phases. We did first the DART HQ staff, then we did the wider DART staff and the wider civil service staff. And I think it was only natural that the outcome of a DART staff, when it's been based in Don House for almost 50 years, that the majority of the staff work there, live in the surrounding area, and obviously would want to stay in the surrounding area. And that's, that's totally acceptable, and of course that, that's, that's what they'd want. So we moved on to the next phase, which looked at the wider DARD staff, which obviously created a bigger pool of people that would want to work in the North West and work in Ballykelly. And again, that was the case whenever we took, came to the staff surveys for um, the wider civil service. So I'm confident that there'll be opportunities that for, in terms of transfer across the civil service, but also um, there'll be enough staff to actually staff a, a new headquarters in Ballykelly. I call George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister because of recent contrary speculation, can the Minister give the definitive timeline for her depart departmental headquarters relocation to Ballykelly? Well, we're hopeful that um, the business case has now been agreed and we're hopeful that we will have staff in place. And you'll know that the, we set it out on a phased basis, but we'll have staff in place in 2017. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the last time I was in Ballykelly, it was for gross insubordination at a checkpoint. Uh, but that in no way has... Uh, deterred my endeavours uh, to go back there. Uh, can the Minister outline uh, the progression which will lead to this swanky new headquarters and all the 800 jobs she has promised? Because I don't want to be a doubt in Thomas, but the Minister really needs to put flesh in the bones and assure us this is for real. Well, I can absolutely assure you it's for real, and my commitment to um, decentralisation is for real. And I think you can see that in the fact that we have, whilst I know the member has particular interest in Ballykelly, but you can also see that we are moving very quickly into the move to fisheries to, to South Down, with um, Forest Service to Fermanagh, with Rivers Agency to Cookstown. So I think that, um, that, that that speaks for itself and that I have a commitment to make sure that we decentralise. And I am absolutely committed to the headquarters move. We have a project management board in place. I'm not going to lead staff up the garden path. We're making sure that they are um, being fully consulted right throughout this process. And, and I think that they, they welcome that. This is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs. It's about fair and balanced growth. It's about um, us being able to stim simulate the local economy, and obviously in the northwest, with the construction, with the ongoing um, maintenance of the building. So the benefits far outweigh any negatives, and I'm absolutely committed to that project. I call Sue Ramsey. I get lost can call you. It's not that often the city slicker gets a chance to ask the question of the Tard Minister. But uh, can I ask the Minister, because you have mentioned a number of times in your answers thus far, if she could take a minute to outline the benefits of, of the relocation? Yes, um, uh, thanks for the question. As I said, I mean, it's, this for me is absolutely about a fair distribution of public sector jobs. This is something that this executive is wedded to. This is a programme for government commitment. So this is something that I want to, to see through. I think that, as I said, the, all the other um, opportunities that are now going to be available for people across the wider civil service to move into Dard in the North West and to find employment that's closer to home, that creates a far better work-life um, balance, that's something that is very much to be welcomed. And as I said, the benefits speak for themselves around the, the stimulation of the local economy, around the job creation, around the, the construction of the building and the ongoing maintenance of the building. So this is something that we want to see happen. And as I said, I've, I have a programme board in place that are very committed to taking forward the project and I'll continue to work with them over the next number of years till we um, see this move actually to fruition. Moving on, I call Michaela Boyle. Good morning. Question 8. Work on a new purpose-built government building on the site of the current Social Security Office at Ernie Road, Straban, is due to begin in autumn 2014. Subject to plan permission and the Central Procurement Division's tender process, this will be the venue for the Straban DARD Direct Office and also a modern Jobs and Benefits Office. I expect the full range of DARD services to farmers in the surrounding area to be available from this office by spring 2016. When delivered, the Straban DARD Direct Office will complete the full rollout of 12 DARD Direct offices across the north. Feedback from farmers about DARD Direct has always been very positive, and I believe co-locating with DSD and Dale is a very cost-effective way for DARD to ensure that our customers in the North West enjoy the same benefits as others. I call Michaela Boyne. Good morning. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her response and ask the Minister how many jobs are expected to be relocated to Straban? Good morning. Thank the member for the question. We're talking about approximately 39 posts which will be um, relocated to the new um, DARD Direct Office. 
The majority of these are going to be from Asylum Road. There will be about 25 jobs. The remainder will be relocated from Limavati, which will be approximately about eight people. And then our existing office in Strabane will be about six people. And that is the end of the period for listed questions. And we move on, on now to topical questions. And I call Danny Kinnahan. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I may I ask the Minister to expand on her reasoning behind the decision not to proceed in buying Loch Ney? Well, I haven't taken a decision not to buy Loch Ney. The, the member um, will, will be very aware that we publicised the report now. We've had um, the executive response agreed, which basically says that there's a lot more homework to be done. There's a lot more scoping to be done. Um, I think that if we get the management structure right and, and have that partnership arrangement working, with one department taking the lead, because the member will, will be very aware of the challenges that there are because um, so many um, uh, vested interests, if you like, and so many different interests. So the, clearly what the report sets out and what the executive agreed was that the first thing that we need to have in place is the new management structure. And we're now consulting on that with the new local council structures. And um, hopefully that piece of work will be created or finished within the next four to six months. But definitely ownership's not ruled out. Ownership's still something that's there on the table and can be explored further. I think perhaps better from the, the structure that would be put in place as opposed to departments, because I think they'll have a better opportunity to particularly look at scope on what is the potential as opposed to you know, just what are the challenges, which sometimes seems to be the nature of, of government. I call Danny Kennan. Thank you very much. I, I welcome her answer and the fact that she's looking at the partnership approach for management. But would she confirm that if which department is going to lead because the council side is the Minister of Environment and we do need a joint approach to make sure this works, would she ensure that happens? Yeah, I, mean, I totally agree that we do need a joint approach but one department does have to take the lead and I'm content that it would be this department that would take the lead. I call Phil Flanagan. Can I ask the Minister to outline um, what role her department will play in any future consideration um, on any decision on a planning application for fragging or hydraulic fracturing? Well, I have previously stated that I won't allow um, fracking to happen on DARD land, on Forest Service land, and that remains the case. Um, obviously, any decisions that are taken in regards to hydraulic fracking will have to go to the executive as a whole to decide upon, given that they're cross-cutting in nature. I call Phil Flanagan. I thank the, the Minister for her answer. Um, can I ask the, the Minister to tell me um, what she will do um, if a decision on plan of permission for fracking is indeed brought before the Executive? Well, I have made my views clear in terms of fracking and I am absolutely still convinced that if we were to move forward and allow fracking on our land, what we will do is we will damage the clean green image that we have across the island of Ireland that serves us very well. So in terms of any approach that would uh, be taken when it comes to the executive, it would be based on, on that premise. I call Oliver McMullen. Can the minister outline what discussions she has had centred around the, the, the current beef crisis? Well, I have met many groups, um, particularly NIMEA, to make sure that they were very aware of my views. And um, over the last number of days, I have actually met the auctioneers um, association. Um, I've met numerous farmers, elected reps, all to discuss their concerns for the uh, beef sector. And I think we, we're all quite united in terms of um, the sector and the challenges that are there for the sector and who we need to be challenging. Over the next number of weeks, I intend to meet with um, LMC, I intend to meet with the retailers, the processors, um, to make my views known, particularly around um, what I feel was um, very poorly done, the changes that they brought forward without any communication with farmers. That is not something that is going to lead to a sustainable industry in the future. If decisions are taken without the, the farmer being consulted, that is not a fair way to do their business. And clearly, the Agri-Food Strategy Report um, very clearly points to the fact that there needs to be very transparent processes and engagement right throughout the supply chain, otherwise things won't work the way we want it to work. I call Oliver McMullen. Where am I? I thank the Minister for that. Can the Minister tell us, on, on the engagements that we, we hope to have with the, the, the NIMEA and them, what other message should the retailers and the processors now take to ensure that farmers uh, receive a fair payment for the, the, the produce they produce? Yeah, I mean, it's been well highlighted and documented over the last um, while around the challenges the farmers are facing in terms of the price that they are getting for their produce. And the one strategic issue I think that needs to be tackled is the issue that um, Despite really high prices last year, the beef sector still faced um, a situation where there was a lack of profitability. So that's a key challenge for us all. 
It's a key challenge for us all um, in government, particularly around needing to exploit new markets and find new avenues for our produce to go. But I think the key message for the retailers has to be that unless there's transparency in the whole supply chain, unless there's fairness in the whole supply chain, then we're not going to have a sustainable industry into the future. So that's the key message that I will be making sure that I put very strongly to them over the next number of weeks whenever I engage with them. Stuart Dixon is not in his place. I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, may I ask the uh, Minister what discussions she has had with her executive colleagues regarding uh, the executive match funding uh, the, the next rural development programme? Um, we're actually working on our way through that process at the minute, and I hope to be able to bring an executive paper in the next few weeks which will um, address the issues. But the member will be very aware that in the next rural development programme, I want to see fairness and balance, and I want to see the farmers supported, the environment supported, and rural communities supported. And I can give her an assurance that, that no matter what my budget is, that, that will be the, the approach that I take. I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Ms. Honey. Uh, very much welcome the Minister's uh, assurance. That's going to be uh, funding for this. Um, I mean, how much funding are we talking about? Do you have enough funding for the programme? Not at this moment in time, I don't. Um, we know our European allocation, but we're um, working our way through what DARD's contribution will be and then what we get from the executive through the Going for Growth strategy which will obviously help shore up the rural development programme. So I hope to be able to have um, some positive news and that in the time ahead, because, as I said, I want to see a fair and balanced programme. In order to be able to do that, we need the money to be able to, to bring it forward. Moving on, I call Tom Elliott. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister if she could update the, the, the House on progress of decentralisation of Forest Service to Enniskill. We're still on target. Um, the, the work's ongoing, and we hope to be... Um, Forgive me if I'm wrong. I think it's 2015 for Forest Service headquarters to, to be in place in Fermanagh. I call Tom, Tom Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the, the Minister for, for that update. Although it does seem a long time since it was announced first, uh, the delay seems to be uh, quite significant. Could the Minister inform us, because the numbers uh, of personnel transferring to Enniskillen is going to be reduced from the original figure, is it the entire headquarters of for a service that will be moving, or is it only part of it? It's the majority of headquarter, of, um, headquarter staff, and I think the number is something around 58, but I'll confirm that with the member, but I think it's somewhere around 58. Moving on, I call David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and stand with the forestry theme. Is there any update uh, from the department on the areas that were devastated by the various three diseases, particularly the vast areas of East Antrim that were affected? Just that work is ongoing. We're um, going into a period now of surveillance, which obviously over the next number of months will be key and will have Forest Service um, staff out on the ground. Um, we have no confirm, new confirmed cases, I think, from my spoke to uh, answer maybe the last question to, to the member. Um, but again, surveillance work is ongoing. We're still trying to obviously prevent the spread of the disease and we're trying to get our message out there as, as strongly as we possibly can. I call David Hillage. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that. But at, at this stage, is there any uh, consideration of a timeline for uh, replacement and planting? No. Again, the, the priority has to be around surveillance work at this moment in time, and then um, obviously we're keen that we, ha because we want to meet our planting targets. Um, um, in the past, we haven't always achieved what we wanted to achieve in terms of planting. So, um, I, I'm very keen that we have some scheme again on, on the ground that allows people to be able to move forward with planting um, as quickly as possible. But the priority has to be around surveillance and trying to, um, I suppose, contain the disease where we possibly can. I call Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for her, her numerous answers? And I want to refer back, particularly, to the, her references to the Rural Development Programme. And no doubt from what she has said, the Minister is aware that the Rural Development Fund is vital to so many rural communities. What reassurance can the Minister give us regarding the new Rural Development Programme, given that there has been zero transfer of money from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 as a result of a certain court case? Well, I think it's unfortunate to say the least that the court case happened because it um, robbed the rural development and rural communities of um, adequate funding. Um, funding that would have been used very beneficially for the farming community and the wider rural community 
for fantastic projects, which I'm sure the members are aware of, but there's been some great projects that have been taken forward through the Rural Development Programme. See, I think there's this misconception which people like to um, peddle that um, money was being taken off farmers to be get, you know, distributed elsewhere, which wasn't the case, because all monies in the past, modulated monies, always went to farmers. And, and farmers are the rural community, so they deserve services um, in rural communities also. So does it create a challenge? Absolutely, it creates a challenge for the new programme. Um, but I think that the executive now, and I've clearly said the executive needs to step up to the plate and um, give the funding that we otherwise would have been able to transfer, which will allow us to have a well-funded uh, programme and going forward, which is very balanced and fair in its approach. I call Alistair MacDonald for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for that uh, extensive answer. But perhaps extending the question onwards, has the Minister had any discussions or has she been able to have any discussions with the Minister of Finance with a view to getting executive funds to begin supporting the limited Pillar 2 money that is there for rural development? It is an executive decision in terms of the allocation for going for growth. So I have approached the executive with an executive paper. The DFP Minister is also involved in that process. So um, th th that is where we are sitting. We are hopeful that we will get some movement in that in the time ahead because I want to be able to uh, hit the ground running with our new rural development programme. We do not want to be left behind because of waiting for funding decisions. So I am keen that we get a decision on that. And as I said, the DFP Minister is part of the executive process. Cahill Boylan is not in his place. As the next period of questioning does not take place until 2.45, I suggest that the House should take its ease for a few minutes.